Last, uh, last Thursday night, I got to play softball for the first time this season in the senior league. So I, I play on a team that, yeah, I play on a team the average age of our team was 68. So, and I'm 56, so I brought the age down just a little bit. But the, uh, the thing was, you can have like a runner. So if you get on first, if you want a runner. So I ran for like everybody. <laughs> And my legs were so tired when we got done. Hey, Kathy, we got a spot right over here if you want. Right there, look at Ryan, like, hey, right here. So, but yeah, and then once I was, I was like right behind the guy running, because um, honestly, they don't run all that fast, so I can catch him. And so I was like, if that guy scores, I should be able to score because I'm right behind him. But the third base coach is like, stop, 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 stop. And so I like tried to stop and I rolled my ankle. And so coming off there, I was like, oh, please not do it again. So because I want to play ball again tomorrow night. So, um, so yeah, you can limp and do well. So yeah, it's, uh, but it's a lot of fun. I love playing ball and I've been playing ball for, man, probably 30 years here in Sioux Falls. So we play at Harmondon, so we get a chance to play over there. So anyway, on that note, um, hey, does anybody have like a phone that pops up pictures like from stuff like years ago that it'll, sh it'll show you like a reminder of years ago? Facebook? I'm not on Facebook. Facebook does that too? What's it called? Time hop? Okay. And so it just takes pictures, time hop, what, then takes the pictures out of your library or something and shows them and... So, okay. Hey, you know what? Peg, we got, we got to pull a chair over here for you. There we go. Not to single you out or anything. <laughs> hey, I love, the, I love the fact, one of the things that, one of the things that we talked about is that we, we are amazed that you guys keep coming back. Yeah. You know, normally when classes begin, people will, you know, those first couple weeks, everybody and their dog comes, and then like four weeks in, it kind of backs off a little bit, five weeks, and then... You know, by the time you get, we figured by the time we get to the middle of the ju July, be the three of us, um, but we would, we would have a good time together. But you guys keep coming back. Thank you for that. Um, but anyway, time hop. So going back, this morning I got in, uh, I got in my office and was sitting there and, and uh, just out of my photos, uh, one of the things popped up. And four years ago this time I was in Israel. And so this video of Israel popped up and so... So I got to see all of the things in Jerusalem again, and, and I watched it, and I was just like, one of the things that, that you know, I, I long to go back there because it is just so amazing. We would have been, a couple years ago, we were supposed to go, and then we didn't have enough people, and, and so the trip got canceled, and, um, but to see, like, swimming in the Dead Sea and swimming in the Sea of Galilee and climbing Mount Arbel and being able to see all of the Sea of Galilee and I mean there's just something that is amazing about it and so then to come and and uh, to work on the stuff that we're working on now talking to Holy Spirit and and to have those pictures back there it's just kind of like oh yeah. I just long to be there so and I'm sure you guys have taken vacations and gone places where you go I would just love to go back mm -hmm. one more time one more time and that's really what I think about is, <clears throat> and how much, if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, I mean, you'll want to do it because the picture, the, when you walk Israel, I mean, it makes the Bible come alive mm -hmm. in ways that you never imagined or fathomed that it could. Because all of a sudden, when you're reading about, <clears throat> like, um, one of Herod's palaces that oversee Bethlehem, you know, and to actually have walked there of Herod's palace and go, oh my goodness, this is, this is from Jesus' day, you know, and so, um, but it's pretty amazing. So anyway, I hope tonight we will long um, for God as much as we, as I kind of long to go back. Mm -hmm. And that tonight when we, again, we're kind of, we turned a corner here a little bit uh, that we said for the next while we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, which for some of us is uncomfortable, um, because here's the thing, for many of us in the Reformed Church, uh, we know a lot about God the Father, we know a lot about Jesus, but if I ask you about the Holy Spirit, many of us will go, um, yeah, that's the third thing of the Trinity, 
And even when we do like the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Maker. I, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who's conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. It's like, wait a minute, that's all we say about the Holy Spirit is I believe in the Holy Spirit? Um, and I think that there is so much more uh, for us to learn. And so tonight, um, again, we're going we're gonna to take that turn. And uh, the paper that you see in front of you, uh, don't, don't panic and freak out. It's like 23 pages long. But one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to give you a bunch of the background material that I, that I read and that I study, and, and that helped me prepare for tonight. And uh, actually, Savannah's going to teach a bunch about the New Testament. I'm going to do some of the Old Testament stuff. But you, that is just for your leisure to read um, wherever you find time that you're saying, ah, oh, I just had some time to read. You can read some of the background material because a lot of what we're going to talk about will come out of there. It's just we, we thought this is such a, a new subject for many of us. It's like let's make sure we give you the background stuff. So, But with that, I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to begin or continue, I guess, uh, with some praise time. So let me pray for us. Father God, um, I just give you thanks for tonight. And God, I'm grateful that as we gather here in this place, Father, for everyone who is sitting around these tables and the fact of their faithfulness, God, to come back week after week after week and to say, hey, we're, we're willing to, to, to study and God, we're willing to invite you to do something in us. That God, you would do something radical in us. And uh, God, not just help us to share the gospel, but God, to live it in everything we do and say. So tonight, um, may you come, may you speak, and may you be glorified by all we do and say, for we love you, and we thank you, and we seek you now, Lord, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you would, you can stand if you're able, and let's sing together. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes clean and my shame is is what 
precious one more time. thank you for tonight again and I just thank you for the people that continue to just show up tonight and Lord I just pray for open minds and open hearts tonight God that we would just receive this message well and God I just pray for Kevin and Savannah Lord I just pray that your hand would be over them tonight and that whatever you want to say tonight you would say in and through them Jesus we love you amen all right you guys can take a seat Right, so we're going to do kind of the same thing we did last time. Today we're not going to practice sharing the gospel just because we figured tonight might be a little bit longer of a night of a conversation. But what we did want to start on is just kind of, you know, reflecting on what we learned last week. There was some questions that were brought up. So we want to know, like, over the week when you, you know, pondered what we talked about, if there were any questions or if anyone has anything that they do want to say, that's what... We just want to start out with, so we'll run a mic to you if anyone has any opening thoughts about last week or any fun starter questions. Questions like what? <laughs> you know, anything. What you thought about last week, if anything was like, you know what, when I was thinking about this over the week, this is a question I had. Or like... If anyone has any fun, like, thoughts that they had about it, you know, you can share that, too. But if not, well, we decided that it would be fun if instead of, oh, oh okay, go. okay, go for it. I was just thinking about last week. I just think it's really, um, just because last week was kind of a little bit of a heavier week with just talking about more theology stuff. And so I think it's just amazing that even though, it can be, we can get into the nitty gritty details about different things, um, that still too, the gospel is just so, it's so simple of somebody that loved us first and somebody that wants to have a relationship with us and just the amazing of the deep complexity that he has for us, but also that the story is so simple too, so. Uh, I'm Caleb. <laughs> Thank you, Caleb. I'm, yeah. I'm adamant about names. I wanna know people's names. <laughs> I know Caleb, but. Does anyone else have any other thoughts? Or even how are you doing? How are we doing yeah. so far? Feel like we're doing okay? Moving too fast? Moving too slow? I'm Deb. You know, I think when we're here, it's so... Um, I know it's easy to be excited and to want to share, and you go, okay, I have these great ideas, and then you get outside, and you go, all right, I was more excited when I was there. <laughs> I mean, because it is. It's hard, you know? And it's so, it's a challenge for myself to go, okay, I said I was going to do this, so I'm going to do it. You know, that kind of a thing. So. Although I, think, uh, although I think one thing is, we've only said to practice so far. You know, we just, we have to get to that point, like Maddie said, where it just becomes second nature that you're able to go through sharing the gospel without going. And then, oh, yeah, then there, there was sin and, and, oh, then there was judgment. And, you know, so that it just becomes that. And that's why we've just said so far, just practice. Just practice. So. I have a story, actually. Today I was at the post office renewing my passport, and that's just a fun trip in general. So I was like, hey, Lord, who do you want to speak to today? Um, and something that we'll be learning about today is, like, dreams that the Lord gives us. And so I had this one dream, oh, like, probably a year ago, and I saw this um, wooden, like, this wooden door, 
And I was so anxious because I couldn't get inside and I was late to get inside. But I was like pounding on this door and I'm like, I can't get in, I can't get in. So I'm going to my post office or the post office today. You have to have a passport appointment in order to renew your passport. So I sit down in the waiting room and I had no, I, I had no thought of this dream. I was like, I don't even, what in the world? And so I sit down in this waiting room and I look up and I'm like, that's the door. <laughs> Like, I was late. I was like, the, lo the Lord knew I was going to be late. And so I was like, ah, oh, it's crazy. And so I was like, hey, it must be this, whoever's inside this door. This lady walks in. And I was like, this is cool. And then in this dream, too, I remember talking to this, this girl named Carrie. And she had, like, a weird spelling of her name. So I walk in, and the lady's like, hi, my name's Carrie. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. I probably looked at her so weird. I feel so bad. But I was just, like, astonished. I was like, wow, Lord, this is crazy. Um, so I'm like, hey, I can do this. I'm like thinking, she's asking me passport, re very relevant questions about my passport, and I'm looking at my five fingers like this. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like doing it in my head as I'm standing there, because they take a long time, so you have time. But um, the lady was like, so what, Chris, um, Carrie, she was like, so what are you um, leaving the country for? And I was like, short-term missionary work. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, it, was, it was probably a big crash and burn. She gave me so much grace. And she was like, oh, okay, cool. So like no reaction. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna like be a little more blunt. Cause I felt like a little Midwestern nice. Like just like putting, like putting like that I'm a Christian in front of her. Like she knows what it means. I, we both know she knows what it means. And I'm like, okay. So <laughs> um, Linda had this great tactic. Where's Linda? Oh, sorry, I was like looking for everyone. She said last week when she shared the gospel, she's like, you know, this is just a crazy time. Like, but th what's so cool is that I have peace right now. And I loved how Linda did that last week. And so um, I just, <laughs> it sounded so much more graceful in my head. But we were talking about COVID and the George Floyd and George Floyd and all of the protests and riots. And I was like, yeah, but I have peace right now. <laughs> And so we get to the end, long story short, we get, so I'm assuming like her to ask questions, whatever. I'm like, hey, maybe you need to press harder. And then I kind of like felt the Holy Spirit just kind of be like, like take a deep breath. And so I just kind of like slowed my heart rate down a little bit because <laughs> I was like going like this under the table and just like whatever. And um, at the end, she looks me dead in the eye and she goes, I'm so excited for what you're going to go do abroad. And then gives me a wink. And I was like, you're a government worker. I was like, you probably can't say that you believe in Jesus until I actually say Jesus. And so I was like, oh man, I was like, this woman. So she, thankfully that was a Christian, like gave me so much grace. Cause I was like, I am ready to share the gospel with her. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of how she kind of said that you know, Linda sparked that inspiration by, like, what she said. We thought it would also be cool. We called her ahead of time, but we're going to have someone come up today and do it for us. Are you still okay with that, Karen? Right? Pick, we'll pick somebody new. <gasps> no, I'm just kidding. Everybody all of a sudden, like, looking down. So we're like, going to pick uh, a number, and it's going to no. whoever it is? No. <coughs> but, yeah. 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 You still yeah, Karen, so you want to come, come on up? up, Karen. Let's give her a big round of applause. Oh, Karen, I'm looking at the wrong person. <laughs> Who are you I... looking at? Oh, you were looking at Carol? I was looking at Carol. I switched their names in my head. I'm like, come on, Karen. Right. I was wondering why she looked at me so terrified. I'm like, <laughs> there's some stuff. I'm like, right we called there. you on the phone earlier. Why are you like? <laughs> like she's like, sorry, you call Carol, me. Karen. Can we Bye give her a big round of applause? This is yeah. a big deal. There we go. All right. So come on down in the middle. Because everybody keeps saying that Karen does such a great job, so watch that step. That step is a bummer. That one will trip you up every time. So how about um, how about Savannah? You want to just stand sure. up so like sure. you have a conversation, just or however you would like to do it. But we would love to see how it is that you share the gospel, if you would. Okay. Well, at this point, I'm wondering why I said I would do it. <laughs> Hey, I have that every Sunday. I have that every Sunday when it comes time to preach. That I go, why did I ever say that I would do this? Uh, but Pastor asked me, so I told him with fear and trepidation, yes. But also with the 
Help of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely, right. yes. Right. Well, how about this? Before you do it, we're going to pray for you. Absolutely. Please. So, Please. yeah, let's do that. So, Father, I just want to give you thanks, and I want to give you praise for Karen tonight, for her willingness, God, to come up here and uh, to share the gospel. Father, I know that uh, the last couple weeks, uh, she's done an amazing job, and to help all of us to see uh, what that looks like, uh, God, she agreed to come and help us tonight. So uh, I pray, God, number one, that you'll remove the butterflies and the anxiety and the yes, nervousness, Lord. and oh, God, Jesus. you would just allow her to speak from her heart Thank you, Father. and to share the hope that is deep inside of her. Father, and it might not even need the five fingers because it's part of who she is, so Thank allow you, her to share that in the name and through the power of Jesus Christ tonight, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, like I shared with the, my group last week, probably the most awkward point in sharing the gospel is the initial approach, how, how to get to it, how to get into it. But there doesn't have to be a set recipe. It depends on the situation. And I have to confess, and I'm so sorry, but one of those situations arrived last week. I went, my husband and I went to uh, Costco to do some shopping. We went through the store, got this big basket full of stuff, came out searching for my keys. I didn't have them. I peeked in the door, and there on the seat were my keys. And I thought, oh gosh, where's my phone? Got that. <laughs> Called AAA, they came. Um, but while I was standing there, waiting for them, a lady pulled up into the parking spot right next, right next to me. She kind of gave me a strange look, and then just kind of turned around and kept on walking. Well, a little while later, she came back, and she said, are you okay? I said, yes, I'm fine. She said, oh, I was wondering because you were here when I left. And I said, yes, uh, I just locked my keys in my car. And she said, oh, no. She said, well, why didn't you? Uh, I wish I would have known when I left. You, <clears throat> you could have sat in my car. It was a hot day. So I was standing out in the sun waiting for the locksmith to come. And that would have been my perfect opportunity to share the gospel. But forgive me, Lord, I didn't do it. I think sometimes we just get so caught up in the day, in the moment, and are not, we're not focused where we should be. And that's what happened to me. But if I had been focused, I could have said something like, hey, we all have days like this. Because actually, that's what she said to me. And I could have said, hey, yeah, we do, don't we? But this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It doesn't matter what kind of a day it is. You need to rejoice and be glad in it. And then I, I said, I'd like to share with you a little bit about my God. And she, she gave me this big smile. So I said, did you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it was beautiful, perfect. Everything was perfect. And I'd like to share with you uh, the lyrics from one of my favorite songs by a guy called Don Francisco. And if anybody's ever heard of him, I'd be happy, I'd be very surprised. But he wrote a song called Adam, Where Are You? And he wrote quite a bit of music from scripture, from the gospel. And this is one of my favorites. I'm not going to sing it, <laughs> but I'll try to repeat it. Unashamed and naked in a garden that has never seen the rain, the king and queen come walking. It, I'm sorry. It, it, I have to start over. In a garden 
but ashamed and naked in a garden that has never seen the rain. The king and king, queen come walking in the sun. They try, they try to hide. The, I'm sorry, I'm really messing this up. I have to stop and sing it in my mind. <laughs> sure you're ready for that. <laughs> All alone, oh, unashamed and naked, the king and queen. Uh, I'm sorry, I completely blanked out. But it talks about how the Garden of Eden was so beautiful, so perfect. And Adam and Eve were enjoying it. And they were having a wonderful time. And they were, the morning all around them seemed to... Uh, delight in, in, in their life, the life they've just begun. And in the innocence of majesty, they come walking in the sun. But the master of deception now begins with his dissection of the word. And with all his craft and subtlety, he twists the simple truth they heard. While hanging in the balance is a world that's been left at their command. But all their unborn children die as Satan bows, as they bow down to Satan's hand. Sin has entered the world. But God in his mercy, who loves us so much, sent his beautiful son Jesus to hang on that cross and to die that cruel death just for me. Because I think about this. If you or I had been the only sinner in the whole world, Jesus still would have went to that cross just for you and just for me. That's how much God loves us. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to accept Jesus into your life. And I'd like you to think of it as this perfect gift is sitting right here, sitting right here, waiting for you. It has your name on it. And think of Jesus as that gift. And all you have to do is open that gift, accept it, and take it into your heart. And he's yours, and he's with you forever. And he went to that cross to die for you, and that's, he took all the sins of the world with him at that cross. Every sin that ever was and every sin that ever will be is gone, and he buried in the deepest part of the sea, never to be remembered again. Would you like that gift? Would you like to take that gift? Would you? Would you pray with me? Would you, would you repeat these words after yeah, me? Yeah, I'd love to. Dear Father in heaven. Dear Father in heaven. I come to you now as sinner. I come to you now as sinner. But Lord, I know that you have given your life for me, Father. But Lord, I know you have given your life for me, Father. So I ask that you forgive those sins and come and live with me, live within my heart. So I ask that you forgive those sins and you come and live with me in my heart. And I want to praise you and thank you for all that you've done. And I want to praise you and thank you for all that you've done. And in the sweet name of Jesus, I ask these things. Amen. Amen. So good. That's so good, Karen. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. No. Yes, that was so good. We, uh, again, we all know how... Uh, the speaking in public is a greater fear than even death. So that's what statistics tell us. So, <clears throat> Oh, here. Okay, my question is, how do, you, how do you get to the level of wanting to preach, or not preach in public, but like, Talk in public without feeling crazy or like having people 
Because I have people come up to me and watch prey over me, and I feel like they're crazy when they do, because <laughs> they just because they do it in uncomfortable situations where I mm. where I feel like I'm in church, but you know. Okay. Yeah, you know, like I have a neighbor. Me and my neighbor prays over his vehicle, and his vehicle works. And like when I go and try it, it does not work. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. What would you say? What would somebody say? How do you get to that point where you, are, where you feel like it's okay to be able to, to speak or to do that in public? Yeah, yeah. So how do you get to that point of being able to do that? Oh, hold on, you got to have a mic. And your name? My name's Peg. Yep, you got to put it right on your chin. Oh, goody. (laughs) Anyway, what I would do is be really aware of their expression and their answer when you say to them, can I tell you? And if you can pick up on that, you can go forward because they may give you this like exasperated look, like, oh great, another Bible thumper, you know, or something to that effect. Or they'll say, yeah, I'd like to hear it. Yeah. And then you know. Yeah. So that's what I would do. So, no, but I want to be that. I, I, I don't feel like I'm at that level. Okay, yeah. So, so one of the things that we've been doing over the last few weeks is we've said this that for us to share the gospel, we have to practice. And so we've practiced in groups. Uh, we've, we've challenged ourselves to practice at home. Because I think this, I think, Jeremy, I think sometimes that um, if we think that we're just going to be able to go do it, we'll, we'll get tongue-tied and we just won't be able to. But I think that there comes this point where it has to become part of who we are. You know, it's not something that we um, simply say, oh, I want it to look like this. Nope, if, if it's not who we are and we've not uh, practiced sharing the gospel with people, when it comes time to really share or to pray with somebody, it, it becomes hard. So, so uh, practice. It does. Mm-hmm. Right, right, because again, one of the things I have to, it's like, it's like I say this, when somebody is standing there holding a sign yeah. that wants money, if I give them something, it is not, I am not responsible for what they do with it. Yeah. I'm only responsible if God says to do something. Mm-hmm. So that's where I have to be responsible. I'm not, I don't have to, same thing, if somebody wants to come and pray over you, that may be that they felt like God said, hey, I need you to come and pray over this guy, yeah. okay? Um, you might not feel that. You might say, nope, um, today I'm okay. And the same thing is true that God might say at some point, I need you to pray for so-and-so. So again, you have, to, you have to be able to know that you hear God's voice and that then you are, you are obedient to what God asks you to do. He is or is not? He is. He's like, that, like, like when my friend talks, like when my neighbor talks, ask me what you want from him. And then when we tell him not to pray over like a cerebral palsy, he does that either. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I would, I, honestly, I would say this, I would struggle with a God who is like a vending machine. Put in my 50 cents, pull B1, and get, get my treat, you know? Um, because uh, that to me, that to me is more of, I mean, that to me is more of the preachers who teach uh, health, wealth, and prosperity. All you got to do is ask and God will give you what you want. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. I think that God would rather I follow and am faithful to what and where he has put me. Okay, And it is less about pulling the levers and getting what I want 
And it's more about being obedient to who he's called me to be. Okay? Because he might, he might not, you know, again, I would rather pray in God's will than simply my will. So, so that's, that, again, is something that I would say um, just to be a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Somebody help me out. A little bit more what? Cautious, maybe again, I'm stuck on the word obedient, so maybe it's just that, being obedient to who God has asked me to be. So, yeah. But again, part of what we're going to talk about tonight is really, again, what God wants to do through us with the Holy Spirit. Because really, um, the Spirit is that, that power that works <clears throat> uh, in and through us. All right? And so tonight, uh, what we'd like to do is I, I want to just... Uh, part of it, again, we gave you a bunch of material in the background, and, and uh, here's a crazy thing that happened Sunday. Anybody Sunday at second service? Second service Sunday? There was a lady that came in late, a lady and a, a young boy. They came and they sat right in the front row. Um, did anybody see her? Did anybody hear her or anything? When, when um, I think it was either, I think it might have been after the message, after the message, um, I was praying, and I heard her uh, praying in the Spirit. I don't know if anybody else heard her. She, I, I heard her praying out loud in tongues. And, and it was one of those things I was like, wow, I haven't, I haven't heard somebody praying in tongues in the Spirit, you know, during worship in a long time. But, but anyway, afterwards, when, when worship, and she might not have been praying out loud because the last time that uh, I know that, Again, I told you that I'd been seeking the Holy Spirit and things like that, and and uh, back in 2002, three, four, um, was doing that, and uh, somebody wanted to pray in tongues, and I was like, um, I'm going to ask you not to do it out loud in our worship because it'll freak a lot of people out. Because uh, we in Reformed Church, we believe in the Holy Spirit, but that speaking in tongues, like during the worship service, we might have like two thirds of the people would get me like, I am so out of here. Um, Speaking in tongues, it's, a, it's another language. It's one of the gifts that God can give, okay? And so it's, it's where you can pray in a language that we don't understand. Romans 8 talks about it. It says this, that one of the things that Romans 8 says that uh, if there's ever a time you're praying for somebody but you don't know what to pray about, you can pray in the Spirit and the Spirit will intercede for us and it will speak in languages that we don't understand. And so anyway, so way back when, I remember once I said, please don't do it during the worship service. Um, then during the worship service, again, I'm praying, and I can hear this person praying just as loud as ever in the Spirit and, and in tongues. And I'm like, I went to him after the worship service, and I was like, man, didn't we have a long conversation about praying in tongues because you're going to scare everybody, and I asked you not to do it out loud. And the person goes, I didn't. I didn't pray out loud. I was praying... In, to myself and I was like man I could hear you plain as day just like I could hear that lady this week and so I was like how amazing on the very time that we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit stuff and we're not going to really get into gifts today um, it's more about what we see in the Old Testament what we see in the New Testament and so uh, that God would bring somebody that that prays in the spirit and I go whoa hello there it is and so, but again, nobody, nobody, everybody else, I didn't hear a thing. Nope, that's, that's probably right, you didn't hear it. So, but it's just, um, it's one of those things that, um, that just is kind of amazing. So, anyway, uh, as we, on your paper, the Holy Spirit, and, and here's, the, here's the thing again, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there's some of that stuff that's going to make you go, oh, it's time for me to leave, because I don't know about that. That's right. You know what? Because again, what do we say in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in the Holy Spirit. And the question becomes, do you believe what Scripture says? So that when God says, here is a manifestation of the gifts, that the Holy Spirit uh, can give you certain gifts, or do you believe that? Or, or there are some people who would say this, I don't believe, I believe that the gifts ended with the Apostles. There are some who believe that. But there are some who would say that is, if God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then are those gifts that God talked about back in the New Testament, are those gifts still available today? 
And we say this, we say, I believe in things like wisdom, I believe in things like knowledge, those are great things, but when you talk about things like healing, or we talk about things like speaking in tongues, we kind of go, those are the things that I'm like, I don't know what to do with those. Or prophecy, absolutely, it's another one of the gifts. And yet think of this, in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Paul wrote that I, I gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Well, prophets. And believe it or not, one of my gifts, when we look at the gifts, the prophetic is really my number one gift. And it's not the prophetic in the sense that I can go, hey, guess what, it's going to rain tomorrow. That's not the prophetic. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's things there are times, like, like Savannah said, the dream that she says, I see something and then it happens. Well, for me, it is more like I see something and God says, notice that. So like a time when I was helping my dad chop silage. And one of the things, and I said this in a Sunday one morning, that when I helped my dad chop silage, God said, stop and take a look at the corn. And I did. I stopped and looked at it. He says, what do you see? And this is going on in my mind, in my heart. That feels like God is speaking to me. He says, what do you see? And I said, I see the corn. He says, but what else do you see? And I said, I noticed that there are no ears of corn on it because there was a drought that year. The corn got tall. It quit raining. And the, there were no ears of corn, none whatsoever. And so he said to me, it felt like God said to me, that is the church today. And I was like, meaning what? He said, because the, the corn looked green, but there was no fruit. And that's what God wanted me to see. And that's what he said. That's, that's the church today. It looks like it's this amazing crop because the corn was tall, but there was zero corn on it. There was zero fruit. And so, again, those are some of the things that we look at that we go, oh, no, 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 I want wisdom. I want knowledge. Uh, that healing stuff is a little out there further, but you give me tongues or being overcome by the Spirit, that is stuff that I just don't know what to do with. And it took me a long time of seeking to get past some of that because I couldn't get past myself. Okay? So when we talk about this stuff, if it seems strange to you, it's okay. Don't, don't freak out. All I would say is right now is some of the stuff that we talk about, we'll, we'll give you scriptures to back it up so that, again, so that when we talk about being filled with the Spirit, that God wants to do more through us, through the Holy Spirit. We'll give you scriptures, but again, it's not always something that we talk about. And just know this, when I began seeking the Holy Spirit, because when I first started as senior pastor, we said this, that we were a group of people who are Spirit-filled believers, who doesn't want to be that? We want to be spirit-filled believers. I've known Jesus. The Spirit lives in me. I'm spirit-filled believer. Now, one of the things that I discovered, though, was I said this. I want to move us just a little bit, and I want us to be spirit-empowered so that when God speaks, we know what God is saying, and we can do what God asks us to do. All right? Spirit-empowered. <clears throat> well, little did I know that that was going to open a can of worms. Um, I was three months in, uh, I started in July, I started uh, June 1st of, of 2002 as senior pastor. After I graduated, took some time off, I actually, that was my starting day for senior pastor, and I actually came back in July. And so I was in the midst of discovering, wanting to be power, spirit empowered. By the middle of August, I had three families in my living room at my house telling me that I was of the devil. And they go, we so wanted you to be senior pastor here at Good News, but we now think that you are going to drive this church into the ground. And they left. All three families left. And I just remember thinking, God, what have I gotten into? I just, I just want us to be people who follow what God wants us to do and hear God speak. And three families have already left, and so I actually started, I started corresponding with the president of Western Theological Seminary, which is one of our, our seminaries. And I said, I, I've wanted, you know, the Holy Spirit to be a part of, of good news. And, you know, we had a, a guy come and teach and prayed over our elders. And some of our elders ended up on the ground. The Spirit came upon them. And, and 
um, they ended up on the ground and some of our elders were like, one of the elders got up and said, the only reason I had you pray over me was because I was going to prove that there is no way the Spirit could put me on the floor. Well, guess what happened to him? He ended up on the floor. The Spirit came upon him and he ended up on the floor. And, and so I started, I contacted some people. Yeah, that, that all of a sudden everybody was like, I am so out of here. Guess what? It'll be just the three of us in two weeks. But, but again, um, uh, I started talking with the seminary, prof the president of Western, our seminary, and I said, here's the deal. We've seen, a, we've seen some things that God is doing through the Holy Spirit. Do I need to leave the Reformed Church? Because I said, if I'm, if I'm off in some place where I'm not supposed to be, I, I, it's okay. I, I get it. And he said to me, he said, these were his exact words, if the Holy Spirit were to come upon your church, accept it as a gift. Accept it as a gift. And, and I will tell you that there for a while it was like, yeah, let's do this, let's do this. But it seemed like we kept hitting walls and hitting walls. And so, and so really, I know that in my heart I backed off because I didn't want to scare people. <laughs> And, and now at 56, I'm kind of at the point where I go, I want us to be radical. And if you're not okay with it, I'm okay with that. But I think that you will miss something that God desires to do through us. And I think that if we start with 20 people who were radical and have radical faith and obedience to follow Jesus Christ and be empowered by the Spirit, there is nothing that could stop us. And it begins with a group like this. And so I applaud you for staying, and I'll applaud you if you come back. Um, but, but don't jump ship just yet. Give us some time to, uh, and allow it to sink in, and read the stuff. Read the stuff that we give you. And dig into the Scriptures. We're going to we're gonna give you a bunch of verses, and we're gonna, dig into it. Find out if it's true. And ask questions, because that's how you get past the fear, is asking questions. So, um, guess what? My time of teaching is done. Um, so if you want to go to page, <laughs> Maddie always says to me, she says, Dad, you talk way too much, and you're never going to get through your stuff. <laughs> They're oh. great. It's a great story. It helps. It helps us emotionally connect. Right. What was that, Kathy? Yeah, that, that no, I just know he's a talker. And he doesn't <laughs> stop. Wow. He goes, I only need a half hour. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, here's what we want to do. Bring us there, Kev. Bring us in. All right. All right. All right. Come on, Kevin. Here we go. Number one, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. It, there is a word in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, that talks, that is uh, used of the Spirit. And the word is ruach. And so it is, it is, really it means this, the wind of God. So number one is the wind of God. Okay? And the word in Hebrew, and I'm going to let you put the word right there at the end. It is ruach. And you can spell it this, uh, this way. R-U-W-A-C-H. Now again, understand this, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew, our, our, our letters in Hebrew do not, the, the Hebrew letters don't line up with English letters, so, so the word is ruach. Now, um, this table right here, Genesis 8.1, Linda, start at your table, will you do Exodus 10.13, and then Alicia, starting with you, would you do Exodus 14.21? Because I want us to look at these, these uh, verses here. So Genesis 8, 1 over here, Exodus 10, 13 there, Exodus 14 over here. And what I'm going to do here shortly is I'm just going to assign you to them. So, all right, somebody want to read Genesis 8, 1 for me, please? Oh, here we're going to give you a, we'll give you a, a mic. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. And he sent a wind over the earth. The wind, that word again, is ruach. Okay, Exodus 10, 13. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the wind all the day and all the night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. 
Right. So again, the word ruach, it means it's a wind. Keep going. Someone over here. Exodus 14, 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. Right. There we go. So again, the ruach, one of the things that it can mean is wind, actually uh, the wind. Now, here's the thing. It can also mean, number two, it can also mean this, the breath of life. Okay, the breath of life. So, Melissa, will you look up Genesis 2-7? You've got it, Genesis 2-7. Deb, would you look up Genesis 7-22? Lisa Jennings, would you look up Genesis 7-15? Um, Alicia, would you look up uh, Psalm 104, 29 through 30? And Kathy, would you look up Ecclesiastes 3.19? Now, there's also, again, here's the thing now. Again, for the breath of life, there's going to be a couple words that are going to be used. Number one, there is the word again, ruach. So put that in there after the breath of life. Ruach is one of them again, R-U-W-A-C-H. It's a Hebrew word. But there is also this word, neshema, N-E-S-H-E. M-A-H. And again, it's, we're just trying to spell it how it sounds in the Hebrew. So, Neshema and Ruach, meaning the breath of life. So, Genesis 2-7. Melissa. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Okay, that one is the word Neshema. Okay, breathed into him the breath of life. Genesis 7, 22. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Okay, everything that had the breath of life, the neshema. Again, those two are neshema. Now, here's what you're going to find in these next three. The next three are going to use the word ruach. So Lisa, seven fifteen. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. Everything that had the breath of life in them came on the ark. Okay? Psalm 104, 29 to 30. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created. And you renew, your, you renew the face of the earth. Okay? When you take away the breath, that word again that is used is ruach. And then Kathy is going to read Ecclesiastes 3.19, if you would. Lord, oh, got to have the mic. Uh, I, I can talk loud enough. I think. No, we, we have to for, use the mic for the, uh, for for the human, recording. For humans and animals, they are no, more, no better than... For humans and animals, both breathe the same air and both die. So people have no real advantage over animals. How meaningless. Okay, they, they breathe... The ruach, it is the breathe, they breathe the same. So, here's a question. So, what do you see in those two words when it comes to uh, the breath of life? Anything stand out when you read that? It's just, it's just two, she asked, what is the difference between the two? Really, there's no difference, it's just uh, two separate Hebrew words that uh, can mean the same thing. So, but think again. We said that Ruach could be the wind of God, that God is moving because there's that sense of you're not really sure how to describe God. You know, that they knew that God was moving the water, but how did God do it? He used a wind. He used the Ruach, that Spirit of God. They knew that, that it was moving. There was something there that was happening. And that, that is the wind that they describe. But how amazing that the same word that is used for wind, that they could translate as wind, is also the word that they can use to describe the breath that is in us. That spirit that is in us. That God moves not only above the waters, not only above to separate them and to, dry, to, bring, the, to bring the quail and all of that, but it is actually how they described life in us was the ruach, 
the Ruach of God would move. So, let's go to number three. Because here's, here's one. It is also, Ruach can also be used to describe a spirit of ecstasy. It's a spirit of ecstasy that is described in the Old Testament. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, Kim, you want to take Judges 3.10? Dee, you want to take Judges 6.34? Linda, did you do one already, Linda? All right, Carol, also known as Karen. <laughs> Carol, Judges 11.29. 11.29. <laughs> and then Peg Webster, would you take 1 Samuel 116 Because again, the word that is going to be used here again is the word ruach. And notice what happens as it's described. So let's start with Judges 3.10. Kim, what does Judges 3.10 say? The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan, the king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. Right. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Ruach of God came upon him. So, okay, how about Judges 6.4? 634. Ah, yeah, 634, I'm sorry. That just throws you off a little bit. Then <laughs> makes you sweat just briefly there. <laughs> like, like ah! Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Aberites, Aberzites, Aberzites. <laughs> those follow. guys, those guys. <laughs> those guys, to follow him. To follow him, yeah. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And what is it again when it describes the Spirit? It is the Ruach of God that comes upon him in the Hebrew. Uh, Judges eleven twenty nine. Then the Spirit of the Lord came, came upon Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. Okay, and then finally 1 Samuel eleven six. Peg. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. All right. Now, think of this. When we, when we sometimes hear that the Spirit of God comes upon somebody, like in the New Testament, when we, we, when we, we normally think of that, we don't think it is something that happens in the Old Testament. We sometimes think that the, the Holy Spirit is a New Testament idea. That God releases the Spirit in, in the New Testament. But what we see here is that God releases the Spirit to come upon for a, a purpose to do something. And it empowers... Yeah, question from Deb. What is the part that goes in there? Oh, uh, just the names, Othniel, so Judges 6, Othniel, O-T-H, O-T-H-N-I-E-L, who, who was the one that came upon in Judges 6? Gideon, G-I-D-E-O-N, I'm sorry, um, you get, oh, yeah, Ruach, no, I, I gave you the names of who they are so that if somebody ever said, hey, that's, that's not an Old Testament thing. No, it happened to Othniel, it happened to Gideon, and then it happened to Jephthah, and that's J-E-P-H-T-H-A-H, Jephthah. It's no wonder you don't hear that name around much today, do you? <laughs> Jephthah. Yep, Jephthah. And then Saul was the one in D. The Spirit came upon Saul. God sent His Spirit, the Ruach, to come upon them. And what did it do? It empowered them to do something they could not do in their own strength. Yep, Carol. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Because here's the thing. The... <coughs> right, right. You don't see that the Holy Spirit was upon or in everyone who came to faith. 
okay? But you see that the, because again, one of the things that we sometimes think is we have this idea that the Holy Spirit is a New Testament thing. That Jesus says, hey, now the Spirit, after I've been resurrected, after my ascension, go to Jerusalem, wait there because I'm going to send my Spirit, and then, um, you know, the Spirit will come upon you. So, so again, there are times, though, that we see, and, and again, uh, Spirit comes upon David. David is Spirit-filled. But these are some of those just to see that in, in the Old Testament, the Spirit the Ruach, the power of God, came upon people and he used that spirit to come upon them for, to inspire them to do something that they would not have been able to do by themselves. They needed that encouragement from God in them and upon them to do what God asked them to do. Uh, something that helps me with that is in the Old Testament, our righteousness was based off of what? You guys know? Our works? Oh, our works, <laughs> what we do, that, depend, that makes, us our, makes us righteous. So because God is holy, he can't make a home in something that's unrighteous. So in the New Testament, what makes us righteous in Galatians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 23, it's we're the righteousness of God through what Jesus has done. Um, and so that's what makes Holy Spirit be able to live in us because we're temples of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Whereas in the Old, the reason why the Holy Spirit would come and go was because of the disobedience of the Israelites or God's people. And that's why like in the prophets, um, you'll see like, oh, these are people who are set apart or Moses. Like this, um, the Bible says that no one has had um, a relationship with God like Moses has. And he like would come off the mountain shining and just all those things. Right. <laughs> Well, and Moses had the opportunity to talk, to talk to God like you could talk to a friend, talk to him face to face, right, right. Right, so he was righteous because of his own works, but we don't have to worry about that because we are righteous by Jesus' works. Does that make sense? Yeah? Now, Rahab? Okay, what about Rahab? Do you think that God worked in her to, to allow her to, to save the spies? Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, would, I would think that God was working in her, yes. I, I, don't, I don't think that that was just, again, they were mortified. They were afraid of the Israelites because they knew what they had done for 40 years out in the desert. So, but again, I think that God was working upon, yeah, yeah. So, now, does it, does it say it as specifically as it does in here, I would have to go back and look. I don't know right off the top of my head. So, but again, so it get, the Spirit comes upon to empower. Now, here's the thing that I want you to notice. Notice that it is wind, it is breath, it is breath of life. And why that is so important that we know that word and what God is doing in the Old Testament is how it is revealed in the New Testament. Now, the word that is used in the New Testament is pneuma, P-N-U-E-M-A. It is the Greek word pneuma, okay? And guess what? John 3, 8. Let's see. Uh, Haley, will you look up John 3, 8? Uh, Mary, would you look up 2 Thessalonians 2, 8? And Annalise, would you look up Revelation 11, 11? Revelation 11, 11. Because now I want you to see how the word pneuma, which again is spirit, is translated in the New Testament. John 3, 8. Do you have it, Haley? John 3, 8. She's almost there. 3 is the big number. 8 is the little number. Sing it. No. <laughs> I'm just how She's got it. All right. Will you read it for us, Haley? Okay. The wind blows wherever it, wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So what? The wind blows wherever. So it is with someone born of the Spirit. The pneuma. And so what is the word that is used there right next to John 3, 8? What word is used there to describe this, the, the wind? The wind. 
the wind moves and we can't see it. It does whatever. Okay, how about Second Th- Second Thessalonians two eight? I have trouble. I always have trouble saying Thessalonians. Okay, Mary. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. That he will overthrow by the breath, overthrow by the pneuma. So the breath. Okay, now Revelation 11, 11. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck them who struck those who saw them. And well, how is it described there? The breath of life. So understand that in the New Testament, they are using the same thought process. It's not something brand new. They use the very same thoughts that they use in the Old Testament. The wind, the breath, the breath of life. And it is used throughout the New Testament to describe the things of the Spirit. So what I want you to see, and this was, it only took, it took 16 minutes. Just so you know, I started at eight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, baby. <laughs> 16 minutes. But what I want you to see is this, that there is a continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah. And that's important for us to understand because there are times, I think, that we see the stuff in the New Testament and we're going to look at some of the roles of the Holy Spirit that we go, no, that is not going to happen. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. She asked this, why is it... Uh, the word pneuma in the New Testament, but it's ruach in the Old Testament. Yeah, it's Greek. So it's Greek to me. That's why, because it is a different language. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The, the New Testament is written in Greek. So, but again, it means, I love the fact that they use the same thing. Wind, Old Testament wind, New Testament wind. Old Testament breath, New Testament breath. Old Testament breath of life, New Testament breath of life. So it continues with the same thing. So what we want to do is we're going to now, uh, you have six minutes. Okay. Um, no, I am just kidding you. To uh, talk a little bit about the role of the Holy Spirit. Maddie said I have 16, so I must be able to match Kevin. Whatever. <laughs> you will easily be able to whoop me because uh, I like to talk. No worries. Sweet. That was a fire hose, which is great. But it's true, like... We need to know that if the Trinity is three persons in one, the Holy Spirit wasn't just conceived randomly, or Jesus wasn't. Like in John 1, 1, it says that the, uh, when the word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, he was there in the beginning. The word was in the beginning. Um, and so the Holy Spirit, the Trinity has been around ever since God has been around, ever since creation. Um, so it's good to just point that out with the Holy Spirit, too. Um, okay, if you guys could do me a huge favor and look under your chairs, there should be a post-it note either stuck underneath or fallen underneath. <laughs> um, and it's if it's still stuck, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for looking so hard. There should be ten. <laughs> this is like, no, not every. Sorry, not everybody has one. There are only ten. <laughs> Thank you for your grace. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Sorry. That is a great thing to clarify. There are only 10. So if you've been someone who's been heavy with the reading tonight, feel free to pass it down to your neighbor. Um, okay. So <laughs> our first blank, our first blank for the role of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is that the Holy Spirit releases power. The Holy Spirit releases power. I'm actually going to give you guys a moment. If you have a sticky note, will you please go look that up for a moment? Holy Spirit releases power. Um, yeah, does someone have Luke 4.1? You got Leisha? Thanks, Kevin. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert. 
That's good. Uh, Luke 4.14. You also have that. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. Yes, so this word, this Greek word, like we just learned, that the New Testament is in Greek, this word dunamis, that's used for the word power, it means explosive power and demonstrative power. Explosive power and demonstrative power. And this is actually where we get the English word dynamite. Dunamis. D, yep, it's already on there. I put it on there. Dunamis. All right, next point. We're going to go, um, he releases, the Holy Spirit releases prophecy, dreams, and visions. Prophecies, dreams, and visions. As we're reading through these scriptures, I'm not, I want, there's somewhere I'm having everyone turn to, but I don't do that. Or the reason I'm not doing that is so we can cruise, so we can, can kind of get a narrative of the Holy Spirit, because this is kind of like the bare bones teaching. Like there will be things you will read through the book of Acts, and you will say, Savannah and Kevin did not mention any of this. <laughs> and that's where I'm encouraging you to go read the book of Acts and see what the scripture says for yourself. Um, but we do this, I'm doing this so that, um, or my encouragement to you as we do this is if you want to hear more of the context of that verse, like why I brought that up, then star it and go and read it in your own personal quiet time with the Lord. Um, with that, who has Acts 2, 17 through 18? In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. That's good. Thanks, Linda. And if you have any questions, feel free to pop a hand up. If you're like, I want a story for this, or I haven't really seen this in my life, that's okay. Then you just pop your hand up, and I bet one of the three of us will have a story for you. Or maybe not. <laughs> we haven't. I haven't has have anyone seen Resurrection of the Dead? I haven't seen that. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying, yeah. We already kind of talked a little bit about, about that prophecy, the gift right. of, you know, being able, like say the cornfield for me was really mm -hmm. one for God. Yeah, that's true. And we did mention dreams, I guess. I, guess. I forgot about that. Yep. Um, okay, the Holy Spirit gives comfort, health, and strength. Comfort, health, like healthy, being healthy, um, and strength. Uh, this is a good reminder as we enter in to learning new things because it's actually the Holy Spirit who comforts us, which is kind of crazy. We're like, what in the world? The enemy could, is taking the thing that we actually receive comfort from, from the Lord, um, and twisting it and making us fearful of it. Because it's the enemy that is feeding us this fear of, oh my goodness, I saw someone laying down on the ground and they looked like that they were taking a nap in the middle of worship. What in the world? Um, it's the enemy that likes to speak that fear, but I don't believe it's the Lord. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit brings those fruits, brings, um, brings laying down in the spirit, if that's what happens, brings tongues, brings prophecy, brings hospitality, brings mercy. Um, but I, I so believe that the, um, the enemy would love to twist everything that the Holy Spirit does because the Holy Spirit is such a good gift for us today. Um, yeah, so John 15, 26. What is that one? When the advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of the truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. That's good. The Holy Spirit is known as the advocate and the helper. My translation says helper, which, but I love the idea of the Holy Spirit. Um, who has Acts 9.31? Lisa. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it, it increased in numbers. Mm. That's good. 
The Holy Spirit brings direction and guidance. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here you go. Hold on. Yeah. Sorry. Well, someone once told me that everyone is given to some extent all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it's just you have some that are stronger than others. Wow. Do you think that's true? Or are certain people just given, like, the gift of prophecy and this and that? Yeah. Okay. That's um, a great question. Yeah. I have an answer for that. Um, there's okay. scripture that says, um, I should, Maddie, can you look this up for me? I'm going to paraphrase it. <laughs> and then I'd love it if we could actually find it. So you can look at, at it later. Um, but it's the idea of why would a father give his son a scorpion when he asks for the Holy Spirit? And so, or asks for a gift of the father. And then I think Jesus says this and he says, so unto you, my father will be good to give you good gifts. Why would he give you, when you ask for the Holy Spirit? Um, so for me personally, what I have, what I have believed in from my reading of scripture and my experience is that I believe that you have access to all gifts. Um, but I, I have seen that like there are people that have graces, like the Lord, um, we're just so, he has created us so uniquely. Um, like there's even been like a correlation from talking with people that if you're like a visual learner and you're really good about like physical, um, like, I don't know, like, I think about how many chairs are in this room. If I were to close my eyes, I can still picture all the chairs in this room. Like, those people who are very visual thinking, they very much see visions. Like, it correlates because the Lord has created us so uniquely and so wants to speak to us in ways that we are good, um, well to understand. And then people who are so, like, maybe musically talented or um, just, like, have, like, audio repetition, like, nobody's business, um, those people hear, like, hear the Lord. They discern the Lord in, in their minds so well. Um, but yeah, that's what I've heard, essentially, and that's what I've experienced. But I know that there are other people that believe differently, and so. And and I think that um, I, I, let me do a little let me do a little research on that question too, because again, whether or not all of them, I, I you know. I think my understanding is that you receive certain gifts. I mean, there are certain gifts that. Um, that you would have that come to the top, and so uh, again, whether all I, I'd have to, I, I'll I'll do some research. Maddie's gonna read the verse that I just butchered. <laughs> Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, you'll give him a snake instead, or if he asks for an egg, you're gonna give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will, you, will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? Yeah. There it is. I did not say, like, half of those words, <laughs> so I'm glad we looked it up. <laughs> uh, direction and guidance. Say it. Say it again. Oh, where oh, was that? Oh, that was um, John 11, verse 11. 11, John. verse 11. All right, so I believe we're on Holy Spirit brings direction and guidance, correct? Correct. Yep, Mark 13, 11. Pig. Oh, pig isn't. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Jesus is talking about when the disciples were about to go be martyred and so the Holy Spirit speaks for us um, Acts 10 23 does anyone want to check their post-it note one more time <laughs> Acts 10 23 that's okay no worries otherwise Maddie can read it Maddie's got it no worries 10 23 is that yep yep then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guest. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. Okay, I don't think that's right. Acts 10, 23? Yeah, I just read it. I think so. That was it. Okay. Oh, that was, I was going to tell that story. That context, oh. that is a, 
sure that I would. That's okay. <laughs> Lisa had it. That's okay, Lisa. No worries. Um, that was a scripture that um, kind of needs a little more context. That's when, um, now I'm blinking. Maybe I'll remember. I would highly encourage you all to star that and go back and read the context of that scripture. Um, because that, um, even when I read that today, I was just like humbled because I was like, Holy Spirit, you can do a lot of things for the people who are willing. I'm amazed. Well, um, actually, if you look beforehand, um, that's when the men from Cornelius come to Peter. And it says then 22, uh, the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him uh, to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house. And again, I think even before that is when Peter has the vision about the, the cloth comes down and he's all of a sudden realized because he was only going to go to the Jews and then he has this vision that he is supposed to go even to the Gentiles and then Cornelius' uh, people show up. It's Peter's vision. Thank so, you. Yeah, yep. thanks, Kevin. Um, for the sake of time, we're going to skip Acts 11 in 21 11 but he gives access to the father holy spirit gives access to the father and then someone on their lucky sticky note has two scriptures ephesians 2 18. okay so, okay so now all of us can come to the father through, through the same, through the same Holy Spirit, because of what Christ has done, done for us. Nice. Is that all the verse? Yeah. Awesome. So that brings us into our next verse in the same passage. The Holy Spirit builds us together for a house for God. The Holy Spirit builds us together for a house for God. And then, Jeremy, do you want to continue reading? Oh, you got vision? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief mm -hmm. cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Uh, no, I think that's more probably, I would get bet that that's something out of Revelation. So yeah. that, it, that it talks about eternity and being with God in his house. Yeah. So. That's good. Uh, First Thessalonians 1, 5 through 6. Ryan. Ryan. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the gospel. That's what I, that's what I forgot to read. The Holy Spirit brings the gospel. So how comforting is it to know that we have an advocate and a helper and one who already helps bring the gospel when we're getting our five fingers out under the table talking to our passport lady. <laughs> That's right. When the passport lady is in your life, the Holy Spirit is there with you helping and advocating and he has already prepared their heart. So sweet. Number two, we're going to start talking about the filling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, so I'm going to have everyone now turn into their Bibles to Matthew 3, 11. Who has heard of the term baptism of the Holy Spirit before or filling of the Holy Spirit? Does anyone want to share what they know about it? And we're all kind of coming ready to learn more is our attitude towards this because the three of us are... Don't know everything. <laughs> I 
Matthew, yes, Matthew 3, 11 Matthew is, 3, 11. Matthew 3, 11 is the scripture. And that's all right when you start talking about yeah. more of the Holy Spirit to have that deer in the headlight look where you yeah, go, like, what? Go ahead. When I, when I think of it, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I think of the pouring out of the, the tongues and speaking in tongues. Right. Yeah, that's good. Anyone else like to share what they've heard of baptism of the Holy Spirit? Does it give anyone and, the heebie-jeebies? Yeah. <laughs> and, and really, uh, when we talk about the filling of the Spirit, of more of God, that is, this is really that point that became the divisive part years ago. Because some would say that the only way that you could be filled with the Spirit is to speak in tongues. Saying, saying that that is, that is a sign of having the gift. Well, the struggle becomes is that you can desire more of God, that you say, I really want more of God because I want God to fill me so that I can know what God is asking me to do, just like we're talking about the things so that the Spirit helps me share the gospel. But what happens if you didn't get the gift of tongues? Makes you feel second class. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be very careful when, when we begin to talk about this stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we elevate that gift above all the other gifts. We elevate that above, above healings. We, we elevate that above wisdom. We elevate because it's one of those gifts that we can see. That if somebody can speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just, just a word of caution, because again, you're right, yeah. that's what we think of when we think of that, that more of the Spirit. So, but it's not, like I say. Well, I was just going to share that that was my experience early on in my Christian life, that I knew a group of people that really pushed that on yep. me. And it was just such a weird thing. It, like one lady sat with me for hours one night and just just start talking, just start moving your mouth, just do this, just yep. do that. Yep. And it was the just the most uncomfortable. Right. And so I've had just this uneasy mm. questioning about what really is it. Yeah. Nope. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We can. Yeah. So the reason, I just want to say even before we do get into that conversation, I think the reason people talk about it is because there's so much mystery about it, right? So just know, and like Kevin, Maddie, and I's hearts, that we're not talk, we don't, we're not entering the conversation because we're trying to push it on you. We're not entering the conversation because we think we need to talk about it and you need to walk out of here speaking in tongues tonight because that is not our hearts for you our heart is for you to know the lord okay and to know his scripture more and that's why you're stepping into radical so we're stepping into this with you we're not trying to push anything on you um i've heard stories like that too and that breaks my heart because god is patient and those those people who are in those those people who are in those situations can oftentimes not be showing the patience of god if you are uncomfortable with something, I believe the Holy Spirit invites you into something that could be, we had that conversation earlier. It's like, maybe something brings you discomfort, but we know the Holy Spirit is the comforter, um, but God is also patient. He is a gentleman, and he's not going to invite you into something that would strike fear into your hearts. He's going to meet you where you are every single time because he's the pursuer, God. Um, yeah, so with tongues, the word tongues just means languages. So heavenly language, to speaking in tongues, right? I speak Spanish, so yo puedo hablar en español aquí, en el micrófono, y nadie entiende lo que estoy diciendo. I can stand up, what I'm going I'm to say what I just said. <laughs> I can stand up here and say whatever in Spanish, and no one understands. That's what I just said, right? So tongues is just languages, and what's scary, the scary, like, mystical thing about it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking through our mouths, right? And we're like, oh. And it says in scripture that we don't un understand what we're speaking. I don't want to get too much into gifts tonight because we'll talk about that next week. But definitely, I would encourage you this week to go find scripture about tongues. 
Um, Paul actually says that he would encourage you to have prophecy rather than tongues, to, and to reach out into the gift of prophecy, which is built to edify the church, because tongues is just for one person. Tongues is just for you, but where people fault is they speak it loudly, like Kevin was saying in his, um, in his experience with the church in 2002, and um, yeah, there's just a lot of weird things about that, um, but also it says that it'd be a sign of believers who follow. So we're kind of in this tension, and we can enter into this tension tonight of, Lord, I've never seen this thing. Everything that I've heard about this thing is really weird. It doesn't really make any sense, but I have your scriptures, and I want more of you, and you advise me to have tongues. So can you help set, settle, me this ten, settle me this tension? Can you help me settle this tension? Um, and I would just invite you to do that during prayer time tonight. Wow, that was a tangent. No, we that, are, but, but hold on. Yeah. But really, that's, the, that's the, the tension to say that there are many gifts. And, and again, I think that, like Paul said, I would rather that all of you prophesy than speak in tongues. But humanly, we've taken that gift and we've said, no, that's the one. And that was really, that was really a struggle for me when someone says, well... And, and I had the same exact experience, Carol. Well, just start talking. I'm like, no, that, that's goofy. And so, no, just babble and do whatever. No, I'm not just, I, I want, you know. And so, um, and so for the longest time, I felt second class because I, I never experienced anything. And, and it was like, well, I just don't have it. And, and yet I think God was doing things that we didn't see and, and I didn't recognize because I thought it had to be this one thing. No, there were other gifts that God, and like I say, the gift, the gift that more for me is prophetic. So hope, hold on, Anna, or not Annalise. I did that to you last time. You did. I see Annalise and I call you Annalise, so sorry. This may be an elementary question, but can you explain why that would be considered a spiritual gift when you're speaking in tongues, no one can understand you, yeah. but you're filled with the Holy Spirit. That proves right. that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. So why, right. why would that be considered a spiritual gift? Yeah. Then if you can't use it in a way that other people can then understand or yeah. benefit yeah, from. Yeah, that's good. And, and actually, I would, I would take you to Romans 8. Yeah, that's good. Let's Romans, go there. Romans 8, 826. Romans 826. And, and this is the part that is, is helpful for me. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Again, notice, it's the Spirit that helps us. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Okay? So it is that gift that God gives us. And so, and, and I'm going to give you an example of it, okay? So, um, so when I don't know what to pray for someone, then I, I pray in the Spirit. Okay? And again, I'm not, I'm not praying out loud. I'm in my mind, okay? I'm, I pray in the Spirit. And what happens is, is that God allows me to see things for that person, okay? So then my thing is this, that I will pray what I see, and then you have to discern what that means for you, okay? So I'm, I'll give you an example of what happened once. Praying, a lady came uh, to our prayer group and asked if we would pray for her daughter. Her daughter was in the hospital. She was anorexic and was dying because she, the anorexia had gone on so long. So she said, could you pray for my daughter tonight? So again, I, okay, yep, we'll pray for her. I didn't know what to pray for, and so I just prayed in the Spirit. And what I saw, then what I explained to her, is, I said, here's what I see. I said, have you ever seen the movie Beauty and the Beast? Remember in the, in the end, if you've seen it, he's raising the glass up, and the rose underneath is dying underneath, and... Because remember, the beast would stay a beast if the rose was, was dead. And I said, this is what I see. I see. I said, I see a white rose, and the glass is coming off, but like the movie, 
the rose comes back to life. And so I said, this is what I see. And so you have to discern. I don't know if that means your daughter or what it means, whatever. But this is what I, what I prayed. When we got done, the lady looked me square in the eye and said this. How did you know that my daughter's favorite flower is a white rose? I was like, I don't. I just prayed what I see. So you, you have to discern what that means. So, so again, it's that sense of God allows us you know, to use that, not for our own glory, but for His. And so, I don't know if that helps answer your question or not. Give me the question one more time. What? Yeah, how is it considered a how spiritual gift? How is it considered gift? a spiritual gift? When, and I guess in your example, you did explain it. How does it then benefit other people when they can't understand you if you're talking right. in tongues? Right. Okay. Because I didn't pray in tongues out loud. So yeah. I, didn't, I didn't ask her. I, I mean, again, it was that language God says, I will give, you can pray in the spirit with groans and God will intercede on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So again, it's praying a language that, that I don't know, but I just know that God said to pray in the Spirit. And so that's really what, and so again, then, like I say, then God reveals things, I see things, and that's what I then pray. So then they have to discern, because again, here's, here's where it becomes, uh, and I think this is where it becomes dangerous, is that if somebody comes to you, and, and this is where we got in trouble, I think way back in 2002, if somebody came to me and said, hey, God told me to tell you this. And I was like, but that's not what God is saying to me. So what do you do then when somebody says, no, nope, God told me to tell you this. Well, I don't have an out. Because if that's not what God is saying to me, and that's why I say, I would always say this, like say with, with the praying in the spirit, I would say, this is what it feels like God is saying to me. You discern if what it means for you. Because then you have an out. If God isn't telling you the same thing, that's okay. I just had to be obedient to what I thought God was saying to me. Okay? Yeah, I have some scripture for you. So I listened to this one sermon that the pastor said that he believes that there are three different types of tongues. He says evangelistic tongues which is at the end of Acts 2, which you guys read last week. Um, the disciples were walking out of the temple courts, and they were speaking in tongues, and people were like, what in the world? Or, no, 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 they said that, but more in the sense of, like, you're speaking my language. Aren't these all Galileans? We're from miles and miles away. They should not be able to speak my language. So there's evangelistic tongues, people, like, so tongues for the sake of others, for the, other, for the sake of others coming to Christ, because then Peter... Um, preach the gospel to 3,000 in that same instance. Um, so that's Acts 2. The corporate tongue, which is for the building up of the church. I have a quick story for this. And I'm going to give you the scripture first, actually. So 1 Corinthians 14, 5 through 12. And that is for the corporate tongue. I was working at this ministry last summer. And we are at a revival night, which is essentially worship night for the city of Minneapolis. And this girl walks up on the stage during this testimony time. And it's essentially like this time where you're just supposed to share what the Lord has done in the night or whatever. Um, she walks up there. She starts preaching this gorgeous thing, testimony. And she's just like, oh, my gosh, the Lord has done so many things. Church, you need to rise up or you need to go and preach the gospel. And then she starts praying in her prayer language. And I'm like, oh, no. And I'm sitting there in the pew, because we're meeting in this traditional Baptist church, and I'm like, there needs to be a translator, because that's what scripture says. Scripture says it doesn't make any sense for everyone. Like, it doesn't make sense for me to go up here and pray, pray in my prayer language to all of you, because it's nonsense, unless I'm believing for a translator, unless there is a translator. And that's a spiritual gift, too, to translate tongues, to interpret. Um, so then... I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm freaking out for the name of this ministry. I'm like, I don't want people to go offended by tongues. I don't want people to be offended by this ministry. Like, what, what do we do? I'm like, God, you need to provide an interpreter. And he goes, Savannah, go up there. Rise up, rise up, rise up. And so this girl had said something in her prayer language three times, and I, I didn't understand it. Like, I didn't. I just heard it, and I was like, I know that's tongues. And um, so I go up there, 
and I say, what that girl said in her prayer language was, rise up, rise up, rise up. And so that was for the edifying, for the encouragement of the people that were there. They heard something that they literally could, no one could understand. Maybe it wasn't earthly language, but then I went up and translated it, and it built faith in that community. So that's the corporate time. Yeah, the scripture was 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Yeah, and then evangelistic tongue. Oh, no, 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 wow, personal tongues, which is what Kevin is talking about, where he intercedes. And that is 1 Corinthians 14, um, 1 through 17. I think that's right. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 14 is a great passage. Yes. If you wanna, it, it talks about prophecy and tongues and right. spirit stuff there. Yes. 1 Corinthians 14. Yes, that's good. Yep, so that's what I'm going to say about tongues. Now we're going to go back to Jesus. <laughs> well, how, how about this? How about this? Would you mind if we start there next week? Yeah. Or Oh, we're going to be all gone next week, aren't we? We're not going to meet next week because it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's our serve week. So we're serving stuff. Um, because, again, I don't want us to just push right through yeah. here. And if you're all right, let's stop there, and then we'll put that together. And so in two weeks, we'll start right there with number two, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, and then we'll begin, you can begin the teaching right there, and we'll add on to that. Is that all right? Awesome. Because I want us to have time to pray. Yes, that's good. Um, I love that. Just spend some time praying. Because again, this is, again, I know this. I had the same deer in the headlight look that you guys have. And so we're just trying to give you information because again, the more empowered we are by who God is and what God desires to do through us, the more radical we will be. So, and so again, I know, Alicia, you kind of have that look back there like, I don't know about this. And that's okay. Because again, remember this. If I was to give you the Apostles' Creed, what do you believe about the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to add something too. But when we were in YWAM, we did the same thing we're doing here, except we had one week of Holy Spirit where we had class every morning and they just like fire hosed it in your face. And it was like me coming from the same background as most of us in the room. I was like, Ugh. so I called my dad and I was like, is this biblical? I'm like, I need to leave. Like, this is not anything I believe, you know? And then he was like, no, like it's the Holy Spirit. It's okay. Dive into it, you know, figure it out for yourself. And so then, you know, they're talking about tongues. And then, of course, all these people there can do it. And I'm like, man, I just can't get it. Why? What is going on? You know? And then we had this week. We're going to talk more about this next week. But, you know, you read about, or two weeks, sorry. You know, you read about when, like, the Spirit comes upon people. And I got to witness that. And I, I mean, I totally believe it from seeing it. But, like, that wasn't my personal experience. Was I wasn't knocked over and I didn't start speaking in tongues. And so... That same day after class was over, I went to my my dorm. I like locked myself in the bathroom and I started bawling. And I call, you know, my dad and I'm just weeping and I'm like, why wouldn't God do that to me? Why would he do that to all my roommates? Why would he do that to everyone else? But like, I can't experience any of that. And it was this sense of like, no, it doesn't mean that God hates you if, you know, he does something different than he does to other people. But I was the same way. I was like, frustrated and I felt like oh God's abandoning me and and it's hard it's like I spent my whole life being a Christian and some other kids that got saved literally last week are like now praying in tongues and I'm like okay did I mess up somewhere <laughs> like what's going on but it's it's a process for everyone and so like just to be reassured that like the three of us aren't here to be like if you can't pray in tongues by two weeks from now you're doing something <laughs> wrong right. so I don't know I just hope that that's reassuring that you know, we all are going to take different steps in this. And just don't compare yourself to the people around you because everyone's journey in this is different. And so if God responds some way to you and some way to someone else, that's awesome. And we're going to be here to rejoice for each other's failures and for what God does in the other person's life. So, yeah, with that, we're going to do some worship. So we're going to have you guys spread out again and just pray and yeah. just reflect on what we just talked about. Yeah. And again, remember, there, there are multiple spiritual gifts. They're, they're not just tongues. You can. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, again, I think, uh, again, I think that that is some of the confusion that comes out of it. Because again, there are some people who push that so hard that unless you do it this way, you've not got it. And, and that's not true. That's not true. But we'll get into more of that. We'll get into more of that. So, <laughs> but I want answers now. <laughs> My... <laughs> My story is that I was asking for two years and I didn't get it until I stopped asking. So, I've heard tongues because I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at Rocky Mountain High and I didn't know it was baptism of the Holy Spirit until someone started putting language around it and I was like, I've experienced that. Like, I've experienced feeling peace all throughout my body, surging through my body. And then I'm like, okay, now I know what it is, so give me tongues, God. And then he was so patient with me because I think I was asking for the sake of the gift and not for the giver. I wasn't asking to get closer to the Lord. I was asking because I wanted this cool gift he had given me. But it's for the sake of intimacy with the giver that you receive the gift. Yeah. Does that make sense? So if we're seeking the giver, you will meet people who have never heard of baptism of the Holy Spirit but speak in tongues. And it'll be these elderly women who are like 95 who have read through scriptures and they're like I don't know I just said Lord I want all you want for me I've met a woman like that and I'm like oh my goodness this woman I was like, yeah. she she knows the Lord because she studies his scripture and she's just taking him t taking him like with an ounce like as it as he comes so sorry this is an interesting transition of a night, but we love and, your questions. Yeah, absolutely. And really, don't, don't we all want more of what God wants for us? Yeah. That's what we're seeking, is more of what God would have for us. So that we, again, become radical in our faith and how we live it out. So that, again, so that when I hear that, that voice, that still small voice that says, Kevin, go over here to Deb and share the gospel I know that that was God who sent me and if God sent me to do that then God's going to empower me to be able to do it and again we learned that that's part of what the spirit wants to do is to share the to share the gospel to share the, the hope that we have so alright here's what I got to do find spot here and remember this leave when you have to you can stay as long as you want we don't mind staying so I know I got to have you out to get picked up at 9 right so we'll get you out there. But, um, but again, move around. Find some, find some place to pray. If you got five minutes, you got five minutes. If you got 10 minutes, take 10. If you got 15, you got more. Pray as much as you need.
is something we don't know about you, Father.
Show sure. 
can get to me and I say yes like your Jesus I say yes there's a gift in your life it's you Jesus, you said. 
Isn't it? Our hearts aren't new places for you, Father. You've been here this whole time. Our hearts aren't new places, Father. You've been here this whole time. 